I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and it is my privilege today to interview Dr. Nora Volkow, Director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And the first question that I have for you is, what are some of the most common misconceptions that you would say exist in the public as well as by clinicians in terms of opioids uh, addiction? Well, I say that a very common misconception that has contributed to many of the problems that we see is that uh, physicians uh, believe that if a patient has (laughs) pain, they will not become addicted to their pain medication. And that's actually not correct. And we know that 8% of individuals prescribed opioids properly will become addicted to their medications. And a significantly higher number, 24% to 30%, may misuse those medications. The other very frequent misconception among clinicians is equating physical dependence to addiction. Physical dependence uh, reflects the changes that occur in the body, it's not just in the brain, that result in withdrawal symptoms. And these develop very, very rapidly. So you are giving an opioid to a person and then you interrupt it. That person can go in withdrawal. And many physicians equate that with addiction. Addiction, on the other hand, is much slower to develop. And um, it actually reflects, it, it leads to changes in the way that the brain functions in such a way that the person loses the, com- the capacity for self-regulation and control and develops a, a very, very strong urgency and desire for the drug. So which is exactly the two things you don't want, extreme desire for the drug and incapacity to control it that leads to the escalation of drug consumption and the use of the drug even though you no longer want to do it. So that's what's addiction. It takes much longer to develop that physical dependence, but Unfortunately, uh, whereas physical dependence, you recover from it after a few days of withdrawal, of not taking the, of the opioid. In the case of addiction, the changes in the brain last months, sometimes years, and require a chronic, chronic treatment. What are some of the initial warning signs that a patient may be starting to become addicted to opioid medications? The first one would be that the patient actually is requiring more medication that was given to them, and they're saying, well, I have more pain, so I have to take more two or three. That is probably one of the first clues that the patient is becoming more addicted. The notion that they actually also start to um, obsess about uh, their medication, that they uh, uh, come up with uh, stories about they're needing more and more medication when, in fact, there's no evidence that there's been a progression of the disease. So physicians should always be very alerted when the medication that they gave to their patient did not last as long as they should have, and particularly when this happens more than once. And uh, two, when they, one of the other aspects that we recommend is and the CDC guidelines recommend when you are seeing your patients, you want to be able to periodically monitor their urine. And if you see, for example, um, other drugs that are in the urine, that also should alert you that the patient may start to experiment with other drugs, that the process of addiction may be ongoing. What would you say some of the challenges to the development of novel pain therapeutics um, are in the research field as opposed to using opioids to treat pain? Well, one of the big challenges is the pharmaceutical industry has cut very much their investment in that field. And in general, whereas NIH is the one that funds research that gives you the basic knowledge, we rely, we depend on the pharmaceutical industry to take that knowledge and to develop it into products. So because they are no longer, many of them have withdrawn from that development of alternative analgesics, that has made it very difficult to bring these, uh, these alternative treatments into the clinic. What would you say some of the uh, most effective mitigation strategies would be for uh, against opioid diversion and misuse? Well, first of all, I mean, against opioid diversion and misuse, there are, there are different strategies that actually, uh, it has to be a multi-pronged approach, starting from the fact that the number of pills that a physician is going to dispense into the patient has to be decreased significantly so that you give the minimum necessary. And according to the CDC, that should be not more than for three days. So limited, because if you limit the amount of pills available, there's going to be less diversion. 
The number two is prescription drug monitoring programs. Actually ask physicians to determine if they're going to prescribe, to check the PDMPs to see if the patient has already been prescribed, if they have been doctor chopping. The problem with PDPs is that they are not necessarily user-friendly, and they are actually don't give you immediate time information. So if you have, a, not all of them, so if you have a patient with severe pain and you need to solve it now, you cannot afford until wait to the next day to see whether the patients have been doctor shopping or not. And the other problem is it does not, or not all of the PDMPs convey information across the states. So if a patient has been going from state to state, it doesn't work. All of these are relatively easy to solve, and there, there's been uh, money invested in the PDMPs to actually upgrade them so that they can give real-time uh, information on the prescription of, of opiates or other drugs like benzodiazepines that put these uh, individuals at risk as well across states. And two, that makes it easier to access for the electronic record. So you need a different um, program system to access PDMP. So if you're a physician and you're in the electronic records, you have to get out of it in order to get the PDMP. So there are ways that we could simplify that. Uh, what would you say if you have a, a new patient who you're treating uh, for pain, what would you say are some of the most common risk factors that could be associated with developing opioid addiction that clinicians could watch out for? The first one that they have to watch out is has the person been addicted to other drugs? And that includes alcohol, nicotine, and certainly heroin or any other opioid. So if a patient has been addicted to drugs, their risk of becoming addicted is much higher because they have vulnerability factors already because they've lived through it. So that is the, 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 the number one. And again, in particular, if you have had a patient that has been addicted to heroin, I would really caution against giving any opioids because we know it, again, we've done it so many times in animal laboratory animal experiments, a tiny little fragment of the, of the drug can precipitate the relapse immediately. So that's one. Uh, individuals that have a family history are also at greater risk because these are things that you inherit. Individuals that have psychiatric diseases are at actually at higher risk. And a physician should be particularly sensitive also, for example, if you have a patient that is depressed, the risk of suicidal behavior or suicide success, particularly if you are a woman that is depressed and is given opioids, is much higher. So you need to be mindful of that, that, that component. And adolescents, adole adolescents are at much greater risk of becoming addicted to drugs. So if you are going to give an opioid to an adolescent, you have to be sure that there's no other alternatives, and if you're going to do it, do it in a very supervised condition and very short period of time. You don't want to jeopardize that young person on becoming addicted. What would you say are some of the most effective communication approaches for a clinician who suspects that their patient may be addicted to opioids? Well, there's not one, one, one particular indication that has, for which there is evidence that it's more useful than others. And uh, that's another space, right? That because there hasn't been so much research, we do not know what is it that works the best. For example, some uh, clinicians propose and some of the guidelines propose the use of contracts, physician-patient contracts, where if you're going to have a new patient, you actually write a contract where you identify what is it that you expect that patient to do and what are the outcomes that you expect from the medication. And if those outcomes are not met, you sit down with the patient and you reconsider. And also it allows you, for example, if the patient starts to uh, escalate on their drug use or they start to divert their medication, to discontinue it. So it's, it's a process by which you as a physician say, I'm actually going to be testing you uh, regularly. Some have criticized it because they say it makes the patient-physician relationship awkward. It does not create the confidence. But on the other hand, if you are very open and you don't do it in any way punitive, but you just explain why you want this contract, then it does, n does not need to interfere with the relationship of the patient. Okay, this is my last question. Where would you say the research field is in terms of any kind of development for pain-related biomarkers so that we might be able to more effectively manage pain and perhaps um, avoid the risks associated with opioid treatment? 
for pain? Well, I think that uh, perhaps the area that has shown the most success as of now is brain imaging technologies, and in particular fMRI, whether it is studies that if you elicit pain, you can generate a signal, and uh, that's the, the magnitude of that signal in the response of pain can determine it's associated with a severity, but it also uh, predicts if you change it, if you decrease that signal, that that person is going to have analgesia. That's a very powerful Another one is you do the scans with fMRI, but in address, you, you actually just have the person sitting then in the scanner with eyes open, awake, and then you look at how the brain areas are communicating with one another in that patient under those conditions, and they've shown that the strength of communication of certain areas, particularly areas that are engaged in the processing of pain signals, but also on the processing of interoceptive awareness, the, the systems that allow you to feel uh, not just pain, whether you're cold, whether you're happy, whether you are hungry, that there is what we call the interoceptic system. And that, that uh, connectivity of that system with the pain network predicts very much severity of pain in patients and their responses. So those are two f- areas that I think that are very like, have very promising results in terms of helping you as a clinician manage the, the patient, but also in terms of development of medications, whether a medication has a signature so if you give that medication and it doesn't change these, uh, these pathways that you know are linked with, with the pain, then you know that probably it's not going to be effective. So that's so almost very, very exciting. We're trying to develop others. Researchers are working with uh, other strategies that are not necessarily just dependent on brain imaging because the brain imaging is relatively expensive. But for example, pupillometry, if you are in pain, you're actually, your pupil will actually change its dimension. And the medications actually can, you can monitor whether an analgesic will change that reactivity, the conductance in your skin. So there are many other things that are being tested. Um, Signatures in the blood, are there signatures in the blood that you perhaps could uh, serve as indicators of biomarkers? And this may be particularly valuable for autoimmune diseases where uh, inflammatory signals are responsible for the pain. Well, that all sounds very exciting. Thank you so much, Dr. Volkow, and it's been my privilege. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks a lot.